Now, we turn to this other diagram, which is concurrent in the fir with the first in terms of play, but is procedurally utterly divorced from it. So that's why it's its own diagram. So it's that same dice roll that we're looking at. And in this case, uh, regardless of how the number of sixes, because that's what drives that first diagram, now we're looking at a different variable on that same dice roll, which is the number of ones. Then we take those dice and we set them aside. They don't go to the Game Master or anything like that. They, they have their own dish or something, and we, we put them aside for the rest of this turn. So if we take away these ones, that means they have a lowered dice pool. So within a turn, it is potential for that pool to go down quite far. You know, if we keep getting successes and we keep getting all these ones, it'll all reset to a specific value for the next turn. That's fine, but that's what will happen within this turn. So that's what these ones set aside are. And it so happens that you have at the top of that little stack I mentioned, the top of this little stack of cards, one thing is showing. Say we're at the beginning of play, then it could be any of your virtue, your vice, or your moment. The brink has to be at the bottom and you set the others in any order you wanted. And so you're looking at one of those. Now you could take this and you're required to suddenly say how this trait is involved, if we didn't know already, and you burn it, which means you take it off, off this, you know, take it off there and, uh, and it's gone. So to do, when you do that, then you take those ones and you re-roll them, and any ones that show up now, they do get set aside, but the ones that don't, they stay in the player pool you know, for the next, for the continuation of this scene. So you see what I'm getting at here, that we have an attrition of the dice pool within a turn as its own unique variable, and we have a way to mitigate that attrition as well. There are some very interesting points about this. Number one, to what extent has this trade actually been played up until this point? Um, so, you know, I have indeed been watching playthroughs and stuff like that for this game. And one thing I see a lot of the time is that people don't play their traits. They only suddenly invoke them and suddenly shoehorn in some play of the trait at this moment. So that seems a little weird. I mean, again, it's that same thing of, oh no, our dice pool is diminishing. And, oh no, you know, going back to that first diagram, oh no, that's our control potential you know, vanishing in front of our eyes, we need that. I need that. And I will burn my trait to keep that from happening, to keep that attrition from happening. And the idea that you do this independently of having played the trait before, you only, you know, are suddenly invoking it now, possibly, to me is more bad design. For one thing, I don't see, you know, something terrible. I mean, if it's part of the system that those those ones diminish the dice pool, then why am I so hell-bent? You know, what about the fiction intrinsically? It may be in the moment that the fiction is such that I'm hell-bent on keeping that dice pool nice and high for the rest of my fellow players um, in particular. But intrinsically, I don't see why I would do this except to turn a knob, right? To go click, 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 click on an available mechanic. Let's take a look um, at what happens as this continues to happen. Bear in mind that per player, because you're not the active player every time, obviously. So per player, you would be having to do this repeatedly, which means enough ones are rolled for you to do this, to want to re-roll those ones, and so when I say repetition here, this is over a fairly long period of play. You're not always the active player. You won't always be rolling, you know, enough ones, I suppose, to justify doing this. So, you know, to keep in mind, this is not a constant option. This is an edge of an edge case. And we're assuming here that this will be happening repeatedly so that you're working down your stack. We'll see in some order your virtue, your vice, and your moment. 
Well, at either the moment is at the start of play or it is revealed sooner or later through repetition. You reveal your moment. And then when you play in such a way that it's called living your moment, which is often situational, um, you know, I will, I will regain hope when I, you know, do this depends on a lot of things in the situation when and if you get the chance to do that. So when that happens, when you live your moment, then you will get your own personal hope die and a hope die gets rolled, you know, in later dice rolls that you may make. Just, we don't need to go into the hope die mechanics or its special qualities in any way. It's a bonus die. Awesome. Okay, so when you reveal the moment and live your moment in play, then you get this hope die. With further repetition, and this will take all the repetition all the way down this stack because the brink has to be at the bottom. When the brink is showing, then again, it's a matter of uh, having a dice roll occur. So this is the initial, you're the active player and you roll the dice, however many dice are in the pool at the moment, and you roll them and you look at them and you say, oh, wow, I don't want that. And if your brink is showing, you embrace your brink. You now add narrated content into the moment of this whole conflict. And apparently, and it's a redo, okay? You don't take the current failure into account as an issue. You see it's a redo. You basically dial back play. You've embraced your brink. You've played your character in some way, which is fairly profound and reveals the worst about the character. And you re-roll the dice anew. Basically, go, you know, dial it all back, you know, scrub the whiteboard, and you roll anew with the dice as they were in terms of number and everything. So it is a great big, you know, dial back. You had to have worked your way through all these cards to do this. And the way to do that would have been getting ones and re rolling the ones, burning traits as you go. Now, why am I calling this bad design? First of all, the edge casey aspect of it means that you are not basically bringing in these things into critical aspects of play except in these mathematically rather rare moments um we don't get to see your character you would have to be playing all those things about your character fairly actively all the time for us to understand your character. You're not simply, you know, looking at this moment of mathematical possibility for you to do this and then looking at your stack and saying, oh, but I could burn this. And then all of a sudden, you know, you invoke the behavior. We suddenly discover your character is a depressive alcoholic just in time for you to remove it from play. So the notion that you are singing for your supper that, oh, well, I've, I have this trait to play now that I want this particular numerical thing to occur, and I'll buy that particular numerical thing to occur by playing the trait. I, it, it's, it's my price to pay. The idea that you role play in order to gain this benefit is quite toxic. It is a poor notion, especially when it is a spot check role play. Uh, well, if you role play your trait, you could do this. You know, you get this. That's very different from the tradition of bonus dice that began with early champions and factored through the Whispering Vault and then into Sorcerer, which is very much a matter of we're all playing all the time. And sometimes it just gives us the hoots so much that somebody or us is playing that, you know, someone gets a bonus die and everybody, you know, just happily keeps rolling along with it. That could happen anytime and in any way and is sort of an open season fun thing. Fan mail was also predicated on that notion of kind of open season fun without any deep criteria for doing so. You don't have to play one of your traits in primetime adventures in order to earn the fan mail. So keeping that in mind, I consider this poor play both mathematically and at a very basic level of procedure. Now, 
given those two things occurring, the dice roll and we check the sixes and we move into all the narration options and checking the ones and moving into this whole trait and burning and, you know, hope and whatnot, and that whole, that whole set of options. Let's put them together. And I said I didn't want to, you know, always combine diagrams, but the game is a bit of a widget and does turn into, you know, a big diagram for much of its pieces. So, therefore, I'm going to shove them together and we will look at this whole thing. You will see that this diagram that I've got is now the first diagram with all of its pieces, and then I have also put in little stars to indicate that embracing of the brink. That's what I have, have put in here. That embrace the brink relates to the initial role, so it can go into this diagram. So there you are at the star. First of all, when you fail, and you don't darken the candle, you say, whoa, I rolled a fail. Stop. Full stop. Okay, everybody, I'm embracing my brink. Blah, 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 blah. I embrace my brink. And now you pick up those dice and you re-roll the whole thing. So that's the first thing. You just, you don't want to fail and you don't want to go into the whole thing about the GM narrating the failure and you embrace your brink, basically show us that your character is kind of awful and you get to re-roll the dice. So you've paid for the re-roll by showing us or being, you know, a crappier person. Then upstairs with a successful role, um, basically you've succeeded, which is great, but then the GM has rolled more uh, sixes than you and is poised to narrate. And remember, you could darken a candle to, to get that narration back. But here we have another mitigating factor, which is instead of going forward, okay, now I'm going to narrate this outcome instead, and I've darkened a candle to do it. Instead, you say, whoa, whoa, same thing, full stop. You know, I've, I've got the success, but apparently the success isn't good enough. You want the success and you want that narration, which as we know from the text is story control. And you don't want that GM to have story control. So, you are basically willing to embrace your brink and then, you know, roll dice anew. Just back it all up, risking failure this time, again, to avoid that outcome. Not the outcome of success, you're actually giving that up. You're willing to give up the success that you have and you're willing to embrace your brink because you cannot stand the idea of that game master getting that narration. Now, given that I consider failures to be part of a successful play experience, given that I consider uh, who narrates to be a feature and not some sort of struggle of control, I find this diagram genuinely repulsive. Um, and I would never play this game as in, in this fashion and with the underlying ideologies and assumptions of it. We can go into some big discussion about whether and why I would say this is not play, for example. And then everybody gets, you know, up in arms and a gatekeepy and, you know, all sorts of things. Yeah, well, it's not play. Debate that when and how you want, somewhere else. 